G'day Team St Albans and our other mates who are watching. Um, here we are in the cool of the evening under the fig tree with my security snake um, to say g'day and think about Genesis chapter 3 verses 1 to 13. Valentine's Day, such an appropriate day to be looking in on our first parents relationship and how it all got figged up. Some folks get hung up on the fact that there's a talking snake in this story. But we had a Ranga running America for years and Pooh Bear is still running China, so does this story really stretch credulity? Whether this is an eyewitness account or a parable to teach us something important about our nature, why don't we all focus on the narrative and learn a thing about relationships and about how we're wired as human beings? So what's going on here? In an episode that finds the first couple trying to play hide and seek with God himself whilst wearing camouflage bikinis and mankinis. The snake is a sales rep, an advertiser. The woman has no interest in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil until the first snake subtly and indirectly draws her attention to it. Then he talks up its amazing benefits. Then her eyes are opened. Wow. She follows the snake's lead, imitates his desire. She takes, she eats. The man who also had no interest in the tree or its fruit up until now imitates the woman. He takes, he eats. What we're shown here in a very simple story is something profound, the mechanics of how human beings work, the mechanics of human desire. And it's imitative in nature. We all pride ourselves on saying, I know what I want. I know what I need. Well, that ain't true. If, if it wasn't so, you wouldn't be human. You catch those things from other people. It's God's design for us to learn and to grow from each other that's how babies become people imitating mum and dad first and then others as they grow to learn who they are and what they desire it's why kids lose interest over the toy they had to have because hang on suddenly over there is a cool kid playing with an even better toy next thing you know there's fighting and tears it's why quite often people run off with their best mate's husband or wife and not someone else. It's why Vikings went on raids or Europeans invaded the rest of the world. The grass is always greener on the other side. We desire what other people have or desire. We're surrounded by a sea of competing lines of desire everywhere, every day. Advertisers know Genesis 3 and its secrets all too well. They'll only use the most famous, the most successful, the most beautiful, the most coolest people to flog their wares. Think about it, you're innocently flicking on the TV and all of a sudden there's that famous person tasting that delicious pizza on screen and saying you can have it by ringing up Uber Eats and getting them to deliver. And all of a sudden you need one. Or you open up the app on your phone and you see that thing on the margin of the screen. That thing that you didn't really need, but now you're starting to think, ah, oh, hmm, maybe I should get one of those. And salespeople know there's an even better salesperson to get in your grill and inflame your desire, your family and friends. How many people watching own a black puffer jacket now for some inexplicable reason? or a fruit bullet, or a George Foreman grill, or an air fryer. Do you realize how you really wound up with that useless junk in the first place? And the younger we are, the more susceptible we are. Why did all those teens back in the 50s and 60s suddenly have Beatles haircuts? Or why is there a seemingly inexplicable resurgence in the mullet? Learn a thing from Genesis 3. Desiring in this way is how we're wired by God, but it can be misdirected. Like that snaky coot misdirected the woman. 
but we do have choices. Misdirected desire can all too easily lead to conflict and mutual blame. When caught out, the bloke went from, whoa, baby, thank you, God, this is the most amazing creature in the entire universe. And now we're sharing life together. Yeah, she is the one. He's gone from that to blaming God and blaming this amazing creature. The woman you gave me made me do it. The woman blames Snakey McSnakeface for all her trouble. The serpent tricked me and I ate. And forgive me, dear viewer, but the snake didn't have a leg to stand on after all that. Yes, my wife's old, rolling her eyes behind the camera. So next time you're blaming someone, ask yourself, why am I doing this? Is there something more subtle going on here? Think about it. Why do you want what you want? Once we understand the simple mechanics of how we get tangled up, we can avoid a great many temptations and pitfalls and air fryers. This story is just the beginning of the scriptures. And this is a story and a pattern that is repeated again and again and again from start to finish. And it's at the very start of the scriptures because it's a stumbling block we keep tripping over and over and over again. Because it's the basis of this thing called sin, misdirected desire. Apparently we can overcome being pulled in the wrong direction by trusting in God and listening to him. Just as Jesus sweating blood and being tempted to avoid the cross prays, not my will, but yours be done. Hmm. What else might we take away from Genesis 3 so that life may not get all figged up? Our first parents trusted a creature and listened to it and so seeded our royal position in creation. Humanity was meant to be in charge of it all, but we let the snake run the show instead. That inversion has lately played out in evolutionary thinking that leads to our treatment of people as nothing more than animals aborting them before birth or putting them down when they're no longer physically capable. And it plays out in our prioritization of the welfare of animals over starving people, like the extreme environmentalism of some vegans and the PETA organization. God put us in charge to rule the world with grace and love and joy. We regain the regal dignity of that station as we learn to submit to him and to trust him. What else might we learn? How many relationships get shredded through jealousy, through competing desires, through eyeing off others that we, when we should be content with the one God has given? How many relationships get threaded, shredded through mutual blame, being flung back and forth until there's nothing left of our relationships, nothing left between us. Trust God, listen to him. Do not commit adultery. Do not desire your neighbor's husband or wife or anything else they have for that matter. God reckons we can avert disaster through trusting him and listening to his voice. The snake turned God's gift into a product to be greedily grabbed at and consumed. Consumer capitalism is simply a modern enculturation of that most ancient malevolent force that's out to destroy us. Some of you will want to say, well, isn't that what the free world is all about? Consumer capitalism, what's the alternative? Are you a commo? Are you a socialist? Because that doesn't work either. And if you're right, how do we get out of it? Where do we go? Well, statements like that out of the mouths of Christians and Christian politicians betrays a lack of imagination and biblical stimulation. When God created the world, he was 
the only one who owned anything. And he was determined to be generous and to share it all. At a local level, people have actually used their God-given imagination and occasionally set up book exchanges or toy libraries or communal sharing of food out of their gardens. But we haven't begun to stretch our God-given imagination toward exploring what large-scale sharing economies would look like, driven by a prioritisation of neighbours' needs over my own. Look at us. We're currently treating life-saving vaccines like consumer products to be hoarded like figs on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because we desire to be well and everyone else be damned and we'll fight over it and blame each other until we're all dead. We got tangled up by the snake's desire to be God. We got tangled up with the desire to know good and evil and it has brought us unstuck because it's a power that's above our pay grade, above our capability. Over the next few weeks as we read through Genesis, we'll see how that power has had a knock-on effect from personal disasters and tragedies through to global catastrophes. So what's the good news today? There is one human being who navigated his way through the minefield of desire, who turned his back on the misdirections of the snake. And he did all this by trusting in God and listening to his voice. Read about how he did it in Matthew chapter four. You've got five days in lockdown. Read about it in Matthew 26 or later on in Luke or in Philippians chapter two. It is, my friends, the way of the cross. He told us that if we trust in him and listen to his voice, we can do what he did and even greater things. And his name, Jesus. Amen.